So now I am delighted to introduce this evening's speaker. Again, this is another popular topic that we've been asked, we've been requested, it's been, there's been several requests for a talk on that. So we're delighted that Claire Boothby is going, to be, is going to be able to speak to us this evening. She works for the Bat Conservation Trust and she's training and survey officer at the Bats in Churches project, which has been bringing together partners across the heritage and conservation sectors and aims to help churches and historic buildings to live happily alongside their bats. She previously worked for both the National Trust and for the BTO, and she's carried out field work both at various sites in Britain and in Peru and South Africa. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and again hand you over to Claire. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, just going to get my screen sorted. Um, Fantastic. So um, can everyone, you can see my screen. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for inviting me here uh, to talk. Um, my name's Claire, as you as you uh, now all know. Uh, I'm the training and survey officer for the Bats and Churches project. So over the next kind of 40 minutes, I just want to take you through a bit of a journey, um, the first half really of the Bats and Churches project. So we're now well, we're just about at the halfway mark of what is a five-year project. And it's funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Uh, and as you heard, the aim is to kind of, is to reduce what is a long-standing human wildlife conflict and to find sustainable solutions that benefit church users, that benefit bat populations and our cultural heritage. So I'm gonna look into um, just who we are and what we're doing what we've done so far and hopefully some of you may want to get involved so I will show you at the end how how you can do that. So um, one of the real strengths I think with the project is that we have five very different partners that um, I suppose aren't kind of natural bedfellows. So um, the lead partner is Natural England, we have Historic England, Churches Conservation Trust, Church of England and Bat Conservation Trust. And um, they are different, but it does mean that as a project, we have a lot of experience and resources to kind of pull upon. Um, so we've got that, that knowledge of licensing, the knowledge of back conservation, of building conservation. And hopefully we'll, um, this will be what kind of helps us to make a real difference in the next couple of years, but long into the future. So just to set the scene really, there are, over 16,000 churches in England that are cared for either by Church of England or Churches Conservation Trust. So there's a lot of churches, <laughs> about, or just over half of these um, date back to the medieval period. So they're old buildings and they're really porous. So there's lots of access points for bats to be able to come in and out of the buildings. Um, and they're buildings that have been in our landscape for hundreds of years. Um, we have 17 breeding bat species in the UK, uh, and we know that over half of these use churches. Um, there was a piece of work that was done in the 90s by Bat Conservation Trust that suggested that at least 60% of our pre 16th century churches are likely to house bats. Now, that bit of work was actually th nearly 30 years ago now, so we do want some more up to date information. And I will talk a little bit more about this piece of research um, a bit later on in the talk. So when you look at some of these medieval church ceilings, um, it's not really that hard to see why, uh, why it's, they're so good for, for bats. They make ideal roosting locations. Um, I remember when I first started a couple of years ago with the, with the project, and um, going into one of the, the Norfolk churches and um, the project, one of the project ecologists likening these ceilings to an ancient woodland. There are open timber joints and beams. And what can be fantastic is actually just that there's so many different kind of small microclimates, different, area, different temperatures and different areas of the church. Uh, so in the summer, when you have the females congregating in these maternity roosts to raise their pups, 
um, they tend to prefer these kind of southern areas of the church, so places like the South Isles. Um, but then there's other areas that provide the different times of the year, for example. So you have um, the silence chambers and the crypts that offer the coolness and um, that's needed for the hibernation roosts. And um, the other good thing, obviously, about churches is that they often come with these fantastic churchyards that um, are nice and rich in insect life um, for our bats to, to forage on usually lots of um, lovely hedgerows to navigate. So um, really lovely conditions. Now, other aspects of churches that make them really useful, um, things that you may not even see. So some churches have these voids and they can be really important. So this is basically an area where the ceiling lining doesn't quite follow the roof lining. So you get these gaps that can be anything from one to several meters in height. Um, and often they can be really useful for, for the bats, but because, um, because the, church, the people using the church don't really know that they're there, they don't really cause um, any issues. And I remember actually, um, this particular image is from Great Totten Church, I believe, in Essex. Um, and it's actually one of my favorite experiences um, so far with the project um, going in clambering into the roof void to look for evidence of bats um, with two very experienced uh, volunteer bat workers that work really closely with, with these churches. And that's certainly one thing that I have found throughout this project, just the immense dedication of bat workers, of church volunteers, of those caring for the church heritage as well. It is really, really inspiring. And I thought at this point I should mention bats in the belfry. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of a misconception, to be honest. They're cold, they're drafty, um, so they're not normally used. I'm going to say normally um, because they have been found to be um, of use in some cases. So Norfolk, um, I know that they've, they've found the occasional bat roost there. Um, in Essex, I know that they've been, um, they've found a number of hibernation roosts in the belfries, but by and large, they're, they're not often used. So the issues then, we, churches we know now provide a real, really good, ideal roosting locations for our bat species. Um, and that's a good thing <laughs> in some ways. Um, bats are protected. Uh, in the UK, um, and rightly so, there have been steep declines over the last century. Um, and some of the churches that we're working with have nationally and even internationally important roosts. Uh, and often they can have, churches can have bats, and the bats go unnoticed if they use voids, as I've mentioned, or they roost under roof tiles, and they don't really affect the congregation. So when there's issues, it really comes about um, when the bats are using the same area as the people. So they're sharing that same space, that main interior of the church that's used for worship. Um, and in some cases, it really can affect the viability of the church um, and can lead to quite a lot of um, distress and extra work for the, um, those that care for the churches. So hence really the Bats and Churches project. So we're wanting to help the church, but at the same time, um, protect the, um, the precious bat roosts that use them. So this um, is an example, this is actually quite um, a drastic example, a very severe example of um, bat, um, bat damage. Um, this is in Stamford on Avon. So one of the biggest impacts on churches isn't really the bats per se, but it's the things that they leave behind. It's the droppings and it's the urine. Um, and sometimes this can, and you can see, as I say, this is quite a, an extreme example, but you can see that, that it has the potential to cause a real cleaning burden for um, what is often small numbers of volunteers that are cleaning the church. Sometimes we have heard from, um, from church wardens that it can put people off going to the church Sometimes it stops certain activities, so certain fundraising activities, for example, like coffee mornings. Um, it can sometimes lead to um, 
less income from things like weddings, that people are less inclined to get married there um, if there's lots of fat droppings and urine everywhere. And it can also lead to um, damage to some of the precious heritage um, monuments and fabrics within the church. So the bat urine is slightly acidic. And just, I just wanted to share with you a video. It is some footage from um, some of the people that are caring for the churches that we're, we're working with. And I thought it would be nice to very quickly just share with you um, the issues that they faced, but um, so they could do that in their, their own voice. I'm Graham Peart. Um, I'm the fabric officer of St Margaret's uh, in Saxlingham. Um, I've been associated with the church uh, in one uh, capacity or another for many years, and I've seen uh, the deterioration in the church because of the presence of bats over a 35 year period. Um, the um, the, uh, the bats have caused us uh, all sorts of problems. We're all nature lovers, but when you're sitting amongst uh, bat poo and uh, urine, um, it's very unpleasant. Um, and we've had lots of adverse comments over the years because uh, people feel that the fabric, internal fabric of the church, um, is being ruined. So we're all nature lovers. I've got bats in my roof, um, but we don't want them inside the church in the same way that I wouldn't want them inside my house. I think my view is representative um, of the average view of the PCC. Some people might even feel more strongly than me. <laughs> my name is Caroline Robson. I have been involved with the church on an official capacity um, for about 14, 15 years on the PCC. My links with the church really go back 50 years. Um, I grew up in the village and so used to come to the church. My mother was church warden. As a child, I don't remember ever really seeing any evidence of bats, uh, maybe the odd bit of, you know, but it was never, it was never a, um, never caused a problem as it were um, and the numbers have most definitely increased in that time um, to the extent that I think we do now have a um, it is not particularly pleasant it smells horrible in the summer um, the excrement is horrible um, looks awful over the altar um, the lovely brass plaques and nice old historic pieces of the church, um, a lot of them have been, um, the bat's urine has um, caused them to deteriorate and, um, you know, we haven't been able to find a way to put them back as they were. Obviously, the cleaning costs have increased substantially as well, because as a child, it would just be one or two parishioners getting together to do a quick sweep around the church before a service. Now we need proper cleaning firm and the costs are, you know, quite, quite, um, uh, quite a lot. After our Christmas service, we always offer mulled wine and mince pies. And again, uh, when we have fundraising concerts, we offer canapes and refreshments. At the moment, as it is, it's just not a particularly nice space to be um, offering people refreshments. Thornham has had bats for a very long time. Uh, my husband uh, was born in, in Thornham and he remembers bats being in the church, so that's 60 odd years ago. Um, but my experience of bats in the church, I've been here for nine years now and each summer we get quite a lot of bats and there is a mess all over the because they roost in the nave um, and so the mess is all where you don't want it really for people to come and sit in the pews and down the central aisle and basically everywhere um, and we just clean it up when there's a service and if we want to do any anything else in the church just before we have to clean the church <laughs> um, but you know that's been going on and we've got used to it to a degree but it, it does limit things. It limits what you can do and for how long. Um, you know, we couldn't have displays in the church in the summer because, well, you just couldn't, they'd get dirty. 
Um, anything that's just one or maybe two days long, we can cope with. But longer than that, you know, you've really got to uh, hear the church again. Mm-hmm. So services, weddings, things like that, we can manage, but anything longer than that. So it's really just the, the sort of the mess, because I know you have run things like bat walks in the church to get people to come and look at the bats as well. Yeah, we have. Yeah, but yeah, since, um, I don't know, must be five maybe even six years now Phil's been doing bat nights um for us and people are quite interested in the bats and it and it has helped to generate interest rather than disgust at the state of the church (laughs) okay so yeah apologies for the bad editing there but um that was part of um some of our virtual bat nights which actually are available to watch online if you are interested in seeing um more from the church wardens etc but also from the project ecologists um, and really really fun events um, but what you can see there is that obviously there are impacts of having the bats in the church um, but I think the nice positive thing uh, just at the end there was the value of education and engagement um, and how much learning more about the bats can um, how good that can be really for helping to build that relationship between the congregation and their bat roof. I'm Graham Peart. I'll go through that again. Um, and that brings us nicely on to one of our pilot churches which is Holy Trinity Tattershall and it's a church in Lincolnshire. Um, it's one of the pilot projects, um, one of the pilot um, project churches I should say, um, and they really have embraced their bats. So this image is of a um, interpretation board and um they and it does add interest to visitors when they visit the church and it encourages a different audience in to visit they've invited school groups in um they even have kind of a little mascot the tatty bat um they've got kind of uh, tea towels and things that they they sell that they use for fundraising um, which has been really positive to see and um this particular church, I've got a nice video here. It's from Barry Collins, one of the ecologists that we're working with. Um, this church is home to a maternity roost of around 700 soprano pipistrels and a few hundred Dorbenton's bats. So it really is a um, sight to behold in the summer. And it's counted, um, these roosts are counted every year by Lincolnshire bat roost. It's quite mesmerizing watching the bats leave the church. <laughs> um, so the project is working with 108 churches in total and they're scattered across England so it stretches from the tip of Cornwall to the Lake District across to the North Yorkshire Moors um, but what you will notice <laughs> is that there really is a cluster in the east. Um, before the project started um, the National Bat Helpline did take a lot of has taken a lot of calls from this area in the east around Norfolk and it seems that there's there's a particular acute issue in this area um, and we think that has something to do with the fact that there are just a lot of old churches and also it's an area with a lot of farmland in some ways some areas of the landscape is a slightly um, degraded that and we think that actually the the churches are of particular importance for the bats um, One thing though, is that we don't actually have, or as far as I know, um, I haven't been able to find any um, published evidence of any regional differences of bats use of churches um, in England. So again, that's something that we're wanting to look at and I will talk about that later on. So one of the big bits of work that we're doing is uh, with, with the project is, Um, working with those core churches and trying to find solutions and of course all churches are different Um, they may have different species using the church they have they're in different uh, surroundings they've got um, they're in different situations so um, the solutions for each church is going to be a bit different and some of those solutions are really simple things like helping the church with cleaning and um, working through different Um, cleaning techniques to help conserve the heritage within the church. Sometimes, however, um, the solutions are a little bit more complex and we're working with some of the churches, around 30 of them, um, we're looking at capital works 
and that often involves separating the churches and the bats. I'm going to share a bit of uh, this work so far. So this is All Saints Church in Braunston, Rutland. It's a grade two star listed church. Um, and the people that are caring for the church really did find that there was a huge cleaning burden and they even considered closing the church. Um, but it has become a pilot church for the project. So it's a roof, uh, they have a roof of soprano pipistrales and brown long-eared bats. Um, they know that they've had bats, they've had bats recorded there for, for decades, um, but it was actually about seven years ago and a chimney, a nearby chimney collapsed and the maternity colony of soprano pipistrales moved into the church. And it was at this point that the church found that actually um, the, the cleaning burden is, um, it just, it was becoming too much really. So this church, as well as being a place of worship, it's, um, it's the hub of the village. And it's also home to some really notable um, bits of heritage, including 15th century wall paintings and um, a notable Norman font. And this is the picture of the interior of the church. And um, on the right, you can, you can kind of see at the back, so this is the south aisle, and you can see at the back this kind of um, this sheeting to protect the um, the medieval wall painting. So in 2017, um, a trained ecologist, in this case it was Wild Wings Ecology, undertook a series of surveys to better understand um, how the bats were using the church, and um, they entered between these um, gaps in the wood and the um, and the brick here. Um, but they entered into a void that was above the south aisle of the church. And that's actually fine um, when they're in the south aisle, but um, there's actually gaps, and you can see they're working on the south aisle here, but there's, um, there are gaps allowing the bats to enter into this main body of the church and to fly about. Um, the ecologists there actually found that the bats didn't need to enter this um, church interior. So work was done in 2018 to temporarily block the bat's access from the void, their roost um, in the void, uh, into the main inter interior of the church. Um, and that was made permanent in 2019. And I'm really happy to say that um, with the monitoring that's gone on since, um, since that blocking in 2018, the bats seem to be doing really well. Um, so they have been monitored in the summer of 2018, 2019 and 2020 and numbers um, have either remained stable or they've actually just slightly increased. So that's really, that's really positive. Um, and at this church, they also, the picture to the right is um, a triple bat box that was erected in the churchyard in 2019 as well. What was really lovely actually is that um, in the late summer of 2019, when we could still all kind of go out and meet each other, they held a bat night to celebrate both the church and the bats, which was which was lovely. There was over a thousand, um, over a hundred people there rather, um, and some and um, we had a talk from Leicestershire and Rutland bat group, um, and it, you can definitely tell that the church community are just much more amenable um, to the bats, which is lovely to see. So the second one I wanted to talk about was St. Lawrence Radston. Um, this is a church that was closed in 2016. And you can see a lot of bat droppings here. Um, this is actually an accumulation over a very long period of time. Um, the church was closed and the cleaning stopped. Um, so this is a really lovely church. It's a grade one church in Northamptonshire. It dates back to the um, 12th and 13th century, um, but it was later restored in the 1800s. And this will become important for, for um, the mitigation work that, was, um, that has gone ahead. So this church is home to a nationally important roost of around 300 Natteras bats. I absolutely love this photo. It was taken by um, Chris Dammon, um, one of the project ecologists. Um, bats weren't always using this church. Um, this poem was, was found in the church. We think it was from um, 
the 1980s, 1990s, but it's about a single pipistrelle they found in the church, which is rather lovely, actually. So here is the ceiling of this church. And um, the first ceiling that you can see, the one closest to you, um, this is a Victorian ceiling. And this is in the chancel, so kind of the area where the altar is in the church. Um, further back, you can see that there's actually, the ceiling's a bit different. That's a medieval ceiling. Um, and this is, this is going to become very, um, very important for the, for the mitigation um, that, that was decided upon. Um, but that area towards the back is the nave where the, where the congregation sit. So this is, um, this is again the, um, the ceiling, this is the Victorian ceiling over the chancel. So what was decided um, between the ecologist, those caring for the church and the church architect was that this Victorian, um, this Victorian ceiling didn't have too much um, historic value. So what they decided to do was to put in a false ceiling. So it would have a void at the top to give the natterers back some flying room, um, but it would separate the bats from the people. So this is what it did look like. And this is what it looks like now. Um, so it has been finished uh, and it has completely transformed the interior of the church. So it's much lighter and um, the church are really happy. Um, and the great thing is that the bats still access the church in exactly the same way they did before. So we will be monitoring this church for, for quite some time. So under the terms of the license, it needs to be monitored for at least three years, um, but we hope that it will be monitored long into the future. So it went from this to the church being open for the Christmas service in 2020. So um, a really impressive change and something that is um, a really, a really lovely um, point for the project, really. And now I just want to talk about a very different church. And actually, we've gone from this kind of big capital works. I'm just going to kind of show a very different approach um, and something that didn't cost quite as much money. So um, this is Chignall Smealy. It's a church in Essex near Chelmsford. And according to our um, heritage advisor, it's particularly remarkable because it's brick. Um, apparently Tudor brick churches are a very rare thing indeed. But because it is brick, um, I actually think it looks absolutely stunning. It's one of the um, prettiest churches that I've seen. And apparently one of the most exciting things is this brick font, which is apparently um, extremely rare. So the church is home to um, brown long-eared bats and natteras. We don't know much in this church about the numbers and how the bats use the church. Uh, and that's really because we haven't gone through this, um, we haven't got a, a, an ecologist that's done a series of surveys in this church. So in this church, what the, um, the real issues were around damage to things like war memorials. Uh, you can kind of see here, the slight damage to these brasses, and it can be upsetting. Uh, so the one thing that we, we did here, our heritage advisor commissioned what is, I think, just a really lovely, um, a lovely thing, just a simple wood, wooden frame to protect that war memorial. Um, but I hope you agree that actually it really does look like it was always there. And this is another example of a different um, memorial that was, was framed and protected from the, um, the bat urine. Okay, so um, this is again, a very different church, St. Lawrence Willington. Um, it's a beautiful medieval church. Again, ho um, home to a maternity colony of Soprano pipistrelles. They also have brown long-eared bats. Um, my colleague, Anna Gay, who works for Church of England, she works very closely with this church. And I just remember her saying that actually, this is one of, this church was one of the most affected churches that she had seen. 
it has some quite interesting history actually. It was um, rebuilt by somebody called John Goswick. And uh, John Goswick started his career in the service of Cardinal Wolsey, who was Henry VIII's um, advisor. And in the church, you have things like this, which was um, John Goswick's helmet. And it's believed to have been worn um, in 1520 uh, to a summit um, of the French King Francis I um, called um, the Field of the Cloth of Gold. So instead of me talking about this one, I will let, I'll let the people on the ground um, talk about it. We've got a really lovely video. Um, just play this now. We love conservation. We love the environment and conservation and looking after God's world. It's living with the effects of having some of the conservation within the building. It's not like having them in your loft at home, for example. It's more like having them in your dining room. Rather than looking at it as destructive, there's a lot of negative interaction. In other words, where the bats are roosting, there will be droppings falling out of the roost onto the floor. So somebody's got to come in and do a lot of cleaning before all these events take place. Particularly for those who have the role of being volunteer cleaners, it's, it's disheartening. They can come in and clean and spend two or three hours cleaning and then they go home and within a couple of hours, it's as if they'd never been here. They don't want to get rid of the bats, they just want to reduce the burden the bats are placing on them and the church so that they can carry on the functions of the church. So a lot of my challenge is about how to try and solve that, how to accommodate both the needs of the people whilst also bats. The reason that bats like buildings like this is it's the closest they can get probably to ancient woodland. And what you've got here is a tall enclosed place like a woodland ride with nice wooden structures up at the top like the tops of trees where they can find roosts so it's an ideal place for them so last year we did uh, four surveys here uh, dawn and dusk in fact i actually slept here the night between the surveys which was lovely i slept i think where we're sitting now but what it meant is we could watch the bats behavior from the bats would come out of a beam at the top of the, the roof uh, they'll fly around inside the church, circling around before they gather at the chancel and exit the building through the uh, uh, small gap in the stained glass window. They'll then fly off and forage. They might come back occasionally during the night, so you've got regular bats coming in and out. But the bulk of the activity is at dusk. And then at dawn, they tend to gather outside the church, outside the stained glass window where there's a hole. Um, they'll, again, socialise, chattering away before entering inside the church. It was a very interesting case, this, because it was important for the ecologist, Chris, to find out how bats were using the church. And he then came forward with proposals, one to filter the bats coming into the church into a new bat box inside the chancel. Now, that was going to be quite obvious, and therefore the architect um, designed a, a new hatchment effectively a modern hatchment to cover the bat box and make it seem fitting and appropriate within the church so once we've a new external access point to where they're roosting we can look at potentially creating a new roosting point around the bat access which is how we arrived at creating a a rather charming bespoke bat box with the heraldic shields on it that honor some of the historical families associated with the church I think what we're looking at now is a longer term relationship between the back group and hopefully quite a few church communities, not just in Willington, but in other places as well. So we've got the bats and our responsibility to them. We've got the building and our responsibility as stewards of a beautiful historic building. And we've also got the living community, the church, the people who meet here week in, week out, um, and the people from the village for whom this is their church. And now, with the introduction of the Bats in Churches class licences, all three of those have an equal voice. Okay, so this is the um, picture, actually, <clears throat> from inside the Bat box. Um, I thought you might be interested in there, but I, um, I love that it's such an um, ingenious um, solution. That was a really good one. Um, so just sum up really with the mitigation works that have gone on so far really. We're in the early days 
So it's the first half of the project. And of course, we need to do a lot of monitoring to measure the success. So the success um, for the church, but also the success for the bats. So we need to make sure that the, um, the bats are doing well um, also. So I think I mentioned it before, but um, the license under the license conditions, we need to monitor the roost for at least three years, but we hope that actually these, um, these churches will be monitored long um, into the future as well, past the end of the project. Um, we've only got, it's actually now just under three years to go in the project. There is a bit more um, mitigation work planned this year, and we are, of course, still working really closely with those project churches. Um, another element of the project is trying to better understand BAT's use of churches. And to do this, we're wanting to survey as many churches as possible across England over the next couple of summers. Um, hopefully, some of you may be interested in getting involved. Um, I'm just going to play a quick video from the Earth Optimism event, which is a free virtual event. Um, it goes on until the 4th of April, I believe. Um, but this just outlines um, what it is, um, what the surveys are all about, and um, what we're asking people to do. So it doesn't quite seem to be working. I'll try that one more time. There are 16,000 C of E churches across England. And inside these churches are nooks and crannies perfect for bats to roost in. Churches are hugely important for bat conservation. A majority of our UK bat species use churches and they can do throughout the year. All of our 17 breeding species of bat are protected here in the UK following huge declines over the last century. Churches themselves are also incredibly valuable as places of worship but also as pieces of history. We have to work together to help both the conservation of our natural and our built heritage. We know that bats can make good use of churches but we don't really know how important churches are on a national scale for our bats. But you can help us find out and bridge this knowledge gap. So these surveys will help us explore questions like how many churches have bat roosts in the summer? What are the factors that affect bats use of churches? And importantly, what are the perspectives of the people that are living with bats in their churches? Those people that are cleaning up uh, the droppings that they leave behind. To take part, you simply need to register, select the church of your choosing and arrange to visit once over the summer to look for evidence of bats and also to go through a questionnaire with your church contact. Everyone is welcome to take part, so don't worry if you've never worked with bats before. We'll show you how to find those telltale clues that bats are using the church. All you need is enthusiasm and to be understanding of the church perspective. By joining our team, you'll contribute to meaningful research that will create guidance for the conservation of bats and also allow us to better support churches. I should say that was filmed um, pre-COVID. Um, well, it's horrible watching myself back, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, the video showed a little bit about the questions that we're looking at, but just to go through in a bit more detail, really. Um, we're wanting to look at how many churches house bats. And I said at the beginning that there was a bit of work done in the 90s. That was 30 years ago. So we're wanting to get those updated figures, but um, we're not just looking at national scale. If we can get enough churches surveyed, we'd also look, um, want to look at regional trends as well. And we're particularly looking at the, that kind of main interior, that area of worship where people and bats meet. And we are wanting to drill down actually and try and look at the factors that affect it, that are affecting bats use of churches. So um, things like the age of the church, which we're pretty sure will have a big impact um, on whether or not you're likely to find bats in the church. Um, things like the surrounding landscape and the amount of woodland cover. Um, 
the amount of artificial lighting. So some churches have flood lighting um, on the outside, for example. Um, so there's lots of different things for us to explore. And the other thing that we're, we're wanting to look at is just a broader view of church perspectives. Now we did the, um, there was a survey in the 90s um, and I know that Back Conservation Trust want to do something similar in the future. And it'll be really good to see if church perspectives are shifting over time. So that will be really um, a really good thing to, to try and understand. Um, it also allows us to do a really good bit of back PR. Um, it means that we can understand how churches are feeling, but we can also um, reach out and help. If churches are struggling, we can provide guidance and advice. But if they're wanting information and to learn more about their bats, we're able to provide that as well. So we're able to be proactive there. Um, importantly, we are wanting to um, share, the, share this information. We're wanting to publish it, but it will also be used to um, create documents and guidance um, for bat conservation in churches and historic buildings, um, and also guidance that will um, help those caring for the churches as well. So if you did want to take part, the URL is um, on the top here. Um, please do the more the merrier. Um, there's the purple button here to join the survey. If you are already part of the National Bat Monitoring Programme, um, please do log in with that same login. So we're all kind of one happy family. Um, when you do come to select a church, you will notice that there's a color coded system. So there are actually two very similar, but slightly different surveys. Um, the first are priority churches, which you'll see, um, which are on the map in purple, uh, is the National Bats and Churches Study. And it is a random stratified sample of a thousand churches across England. Um, so we're asking you to do a daytime visit to the church between June and August. Uh, to look for evidence of bats and to go through a questionnaire with uh, your church contact. But one thing that we are looking to do um, is to um, understand which bats are using churches, if indeed bats are using the church. So we will lend you a bat detector and we'll ask you to collect droppings for DNA analysis. The second one is church bat detectors. And you can do this at um, the other 16,000 odd churches in England. And this is really similar, but here, instead of borrowing equipment from us, um, we're really just looking at whether there is um, evidence of that presence in the church or not. So we piloted this in 2019. Um, of course, things didn't quite go as planned in 2020, but I don't think they went as planned for, for any of us really. Um, but so far, we've surveyed 115 churches and we've had a nice um, coverage across England. And of those churches, just under 70 percent, uh, we found evidence of bats. Um, it's really too early to draw any conclusions from this. Um, we'd really like um, we'd really, really like in the next couple of summers to get above 500 churches surveyed. And um, I should say here that. Um, we are really interested in churches, um, even if you don't think they're likely to have bats, we are really interested to know. And actually that, um, that information, that null information is extremely important for the research as well. So um, just kind of where we are at the moment, um, brown long-eared bats have kind of pipped common pipistrels to the post as the um, bat that we've found in the most churches so far. So we found them in 39 churches, um, closely followed by common pipistrels um, in 35 churches, soprano pipistrels in 14, and serotine in 14. But in this study so far, we've recorded nine species. Um, there's been some really interesting records. Um, we had one record um, from Devon of a grey long-eared bat, so a very rare, um, very rare record indeed. Um, and we've had a couple of barbicel records, which is quite exciting. And it's not a bat species that we often hear of um, reported in church buildings. So hopefully some of you will be interested in taking part in the surveys. Um, if so, thank you very much. Um, 
But if you're not sure about taking part, but you'd like to learn more, uh, we do have a lot of information on our website. So it's batsandchurches.org.uk. And um, there's free training and events to get involved with. And I would really, really recommend um, our Bats and Churches live webinars. Um, the next one is on the 28th of April at 12 p.m. and it's talking about church roofs. Um, but we have the old ones available, the, um, the, one, the previous ones available to watch um, there on our YouTube channel and you can get to it via our website. Uh, yesterday we had one, How to Date a Church, and it was a really fascinating exploration um, with experts talking through the features to look for uh, um, regarding architecture and church fabric to understand the, the kind of when it was built, um, et cetera. It was really, really interesting. Uh, we've had other ones about bats and disease uh, and just really kind of looking at what we know about our, our British bats. So um, that's all there on the website to, um, to explore. And I just wanted to finish with a, well, I think it's one of my favorite um, video clips from, um, from churches. It's just a little reminder that it's not necessarily just bats and people that use um, church buildings. Um, but that um, tawny owl was um, looked like it was after um, looks like it was after its dinner. Um, but just to finish there, just I uh, want to say thank you to the people um, whose images I've used, um, and also of course to the National Lottery Heritage Fund and anyone that plays the um, the, the lottery. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you ever so much, Claire. That was really fantastic. And I thought just pointed out the value, how important the churches are for, I, I thought it was interesting, the comparison of them with ancient woodlands um, and sort of see, yeah, it was, that was a really useful way to think about them, I think, as, as buildings, but it was very thoughtful and sensitive how we're thinking about how to combat some people coexist. It's not easy, but it sounds like this is a really good partnership. And thank you also for pointing out all these resources that people can follow up as well. And the, you know, please do get and think about getting involved with that survey. It sounds a you know, fantastic thing. And I, already I can see in the chat various people talking about information they already know about local churches or that they're interested in having a look at their local churches so that's fantastic we've also got a lot of questions coming through so i think if we go straight over uh, and pick up a couple of questions from the chat um uh, david is that all right if you pick up a couple of yeah. people and we'll see how many we can get through thank you yeah i'll i'll, I'll try and brigade a few together to save time um so there, was, there was a series of questions about is it possible to look at other historic buildings as well as churches are there are there similar issues can we identify bats there and also yeah. whether this issue is also going on in, in the sort of religious buildings of, of other religious traditions than just the christian tradition yeah it's a really good question um so it's it's a difficult one <laughs> yes we do want to work with other historic buildings and of course from historic england's point of view and um, the learnings that we get will hopefully be we'll be able to translate some of them into guidance for other historic buildings um, with and in regards to the other denominations and other faiths uh, of course it would be really interesting to to learn to learn more about bats use of um, of other places of worship um, in England we have found that the C of E churches do tend to be particularly um, there tends to be this this conflict um, so we think it's really because of the age of the churches and that, so they tend to be particularly good for the bats. So this is where we get this conflict. So um, 
this is this project's kind of been a really long time in the making because there really was there really has been this kind of long-standing conflict so that's what we're kind of aiming to combat with this particular project um, and of course our um, our partners are Church of England and Church's Conservation Trust um, so we're really kind of targeting what um, what has really been the kind of the center of the of the issue does that has that answered the, the question <laughs> yeah I think that that, that addressed I might come in with something, Claire, just to explain, because I think sometimes people don't understand the way that the, the funding works as well. Yeah. It's a National Lottery Heritage Fund and they're funded to work in England. So that automatically excludes Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish churches. Is that is that right, Claire? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it, it's, it's not necessarily a conscious decision. It's because of the grant as well. Excellent. Well, that, that was what I was going to ask about next, Kieran. So you've uh, you've sneakily <laughs> anticipated. Well, um, there, were, there were a few questions about the the things that you're doing. Um, I'll, I'll try and put a couple of them together and see if there's a theme. What one was? Would it be possible to secure the um, you know block the holes and create bat boxes outside the church so the bats didn't come in? Um, and there was also questions about when you build these structures and these cavities for them, do they not just fill up with guano you rather delicately called it um they have so that is um a factor that the ecologists have been planning in so a way of cleaning them and some of them have kind of of cleaning hatches in them that um to make it easier for cleaning others have to be cleaned out and um, so they have kind of put that element into the the design of the the mitigation um in terms of the the specifics of um, the mitigation for each of the churches is quite a difficult one because each of the churches are unique and the way the bats are using the churches are unique. Um, so you kind of have to work with that church and that particular that particular setting as to how you have to kind of see how the bats are using the church and we all also can't kind of we have to help the church but also make sure that the bats are also okay. Um, there was a, um, one of the Stamford on Avon was one of the pilot churches actually in the development phase. And um, they did use a heated external bat box. Um, so it is something that has, um, has been used. And uh, if anyone is interested um, and they want to get in, in touch, I can, I can give you um, more of the details around, around that, um, that bit of mitigation. Thank you. Um, we're going to go now to Jeff Turner Ross. If you'd like to ask your question live, if you just unmute yourself. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, hi, Claire. Hi, Jeff. Hey, great presentation. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, in the Southwest, there's hardly any bats there at all. Um, is that because you've not had the volunteers or the people to go down there? Because I appreciate that Cornwall and Devon are huge areas and you've got. Uh, churches in Dartmoor and churches all over the place, which sometimes might be inaccessible or very difficult to get to. Um, or is it to do with climate down there, which is slightly different from up here in London? Well, I will actually say, so there's a few of our project churches in Cornwall, but Southwest can actually be fantastic for bats and for bats and churches. So it is a shame that we don't have more project churches your way in the, in the Southwest. Um, certainly, though, with the study, with our surveys, uh, we are really wanting to get more information from the Southwest. So please do consider surveying your local church. But yeah, you can get some fantastic um, churches for bats um, in the Southwest. And of course, you've got some lovely species. So um, the, the horseshoe bats, for example, um, the greater and lesser horseshoe bats um, are known to use churches. Um, as I said, in the I think I, I mentioned it, but we had a, um, a record in the first year, the pilot year of the Bats and Churches study, we had um, a record of very long-eared bats using um, a church in Devon. So um, the Southwest can be absolutely fantastic for Bats okay. and Churches. Okay, and I assume that's the same for Yorkshire as well, because I noticed there was no dots there in Yorkshire in the north, so similar. Yeah, it's, it is, it's quite difficult. Yeah, the, the, um, with the project churches, um, it's just it's, it is a bit of a bias towards the east, particularly um, 
around Norfolk, um, mainly because there has been this kind of real conflict there in the past. So it's kind of really wanting to, um, to disentangle that really. Um, so we have, I suppose, got a bit of a waiting towards the east um, with fewer churches um, elsewhere, but they can still, um, but still use, um, use churches in these areas. And hopefully with the um, surveys, we'll be able to actually look at these regional trends and I'll be able to give you kind of um, a bit, a, a more thorough answer, I suppose, based on evidence. Okay, thank you so much on behalf of my wife and my mother-in-law. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's, yeah, it's nice that you, everybody in the family seems to be enjoying the talk. We've, we've, we, we, we're really running out of time now. So maybe, David, we'll just take one last quick question. Yeah, from no, the that's it. We'll yeah, what, one more. It, it slightly builds on what you just talked about, but given where we're it's a natural society based in an urban area. It seems really relevant. So, um, somebody, I've lost the name now, but somebody asked whether you're going to be able to compare the difference in patterns between rural and urban churches. Um, we are, I mean, we need, so at the moment, um, we actually don't have many churches included in the study in more urban areas. So I really would say, um, please do get out and um, uh, select a church in your um, in your area and go and survey it. Um, we really do need that information from the from more urban locations. So um, the answer to that question is yes. Um, if we if we get enough churches surveyed. So that's that's basically the message, I think, really, isn't it? The more we kind of think, more people will vol volunteer, and the more churches we can actually have a look at the more we're going to have a national picture of where the bats, where bats are, what bats are doing, which churches bats are using. So, you know, pl please do, anybody who is interested, please do have a look on the website and, and get involved, and particularly perhaps in some of those areas where there's not been such a, an intense sort of coverage, because, it, you know, those are probably the areas we particularly need to know more about. Sorry we didn't get time to take everybody's questions. Um, I, don't, I guess, people, can people contact you through yeah. the is yeah they can i've got my i've put my email address in the chat if you want to get in touch with me um please do <laughs> is that okay lovely so <laughs> thank you very much um yeah that's great and of course the recording will go on in the um, in the next day or two the, so if people want to kind of follow up with that um but do get, if, if there are any questions that you really you know, didn't get answered then thank you very much claire for offering to follow up with those so it is time to wrap up, I'm afraid. I know we could always, we can always spend, you know, long, long periods of time, but we, we're past 7.30, so we are going to finish off now. Thank you to everyone for coming and for taking part. And thanks again for a really great talk, Claire, and for some very inspiring thoughts. Also some things for us to go off and do. Our next LNHS talk will be on Thursday, the 15th of April, so in two weeks' time. And